Hello there, a warm welcome to uh, Eye on Africa. I'm Rochelle ferguson Biahi. These are the top stories on the continent. Madagascar's uh, top court rules the president must form a national unity government in order to end a political deadlock. We bring you the very latest with our correspondent, Gail Borgia, who's uh, standing by in the capital, Antanarivo. Next, filmmakers in Kenya say they're outraged after being told by authorities they'll need to obtain a license to operate or face hefty fines and jail time and how to get uh, young Africans passionate about uh, agriculture again. Well, that's just the question that uh, Chion Yang, the founder of Jeffzone, is asking. He's created a platform encouraging uh, young people back into farming. But first, Madagascar's top court has ruled that the president must form a national unity government in order to end a political deadlock. Now, earlier this Friday, the court ruled that the president should dissolve the government and elect a prime minister within seven days. Well, violent uh, demonstrations were uh, sparked in Madagascar recently after a proposed electoral law which would have barred opposition candidates from elections this year. Well, to bring us more on this, uh, France 24's Gaël Bourget is standing by in Antanariva. Let's cross to her. Uh, Gaël, first of all, what, what's the latest we know about this decision by the court? Um, the, the, the country's political stability uh, was riding on this uh, constitutional high court uh, decision. Uh, you have to know that for the past month, hundreds of protesters, including MPs, have taken to the streets demanding the president step down. And this is uh, their second attempt at trying to depose the president, who they accuse of not respecting a uh, constitution. Protesters accuse the president of dragging his feet to put the High Court of Justice in place. Um, the, 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 this High Court of Justice is uh, the only institution to a able to judge a president here. The High Court of Justice is still not properly um, in place, but the Constitutional High Court uh, decided to save the president, change the prime minister and his government. Um, but now um, this, um, the, the, the High Constitutional High Court um, decided to give 10 days to the opposition and the president to discuss and find an agreement. And if it fails, uh, the president will have uh, to change the government and create um, a national unity uh, government. OK, Gail, uh, keeping us up to date uh, from Antanarivo, thanks very much. In other news, in uh, DR Congo, officials say at least 50 people have died uh, in a boat accident this week on the river in the remote northwest of the country. Now, the accident happened on the Momboyo River on Wednesday night. According to residents, the boat had been transporting passengers and goods to the city of Bandaka when it capsized. Filmmakers in Kenya say they're outraged after being told by authorities they now need to obtain a licence to operate or face hefty fines and jail time. Well, in line with the 1963 law, Kenyans that films at classification board will now need to approve filmmakers' scripts. Officials say it's all about better regulating the industry. Filmmakers, though, argue it stifles creativity. Lauren Bersticker has details in this report. Hailed as a breakthrough for African cinema, Rafiki was the first Kenyan film to feature at the Cannes Film Festival. But this love story between two teenage girls failed to convince censors at home, where it was banned by Kenya's Film Classification Board. We restricted Wanuri's film, Rafiki, because it endorses homosexuality. In Kenya, movies must have their scripts approved by a state-sponsored commission, the KFCB, in order to obtain an official license. The law has existed since Kenya declared independence in 1963, but the commission recently ramped up its crackdown on non-compliant filmmakers, saying it wants to prevent the broadcasting of radical and pornographic material. We are now coming to a crackdown. We are starting raids. And it's not because we want to criminalize creativity. It's because they are bad apples within the industry. Many Kenyan filmmakers have spoken out against the crackdown, calling it a blatant attempt at government censorship. David Gitonga, whose latest film was given an 18 and over rating, has called on authorities to work with Kenya's film industry to update what he calls an archaic law. We abide by the law, always taking a film license, um, but we need it to work for us. At the end of the day, we are an industry that, an, an industry that pays taxes. You know, so it's a win-win for everybody. 
Kenya's film industry has seen a revival in recent years. In 2016, it was worth an estimated 2 billion US dollars, up from 600 million in 2007. Well, uh, difficult to describe, but to describe, excuse me, tonight's guest in a few words, because he has so many uh, different hats. Tiong Yang is uh, the founder of Jeff Zone Farms, which, but he's also a political uh, activist. He's a community leader, a motivational speaker. Uh, Tiong, uh, very welcome, uh, very warm welcome to you this evening. Thank you. Now, the last time we saw you, you were investing in energy in Africa with uh, the superstar Acon. This time, you have set up a platform to encourage Africans back to farming. Yes. Young Africans, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, you're also in Paris at the moment for VivaTech, that huge, huge uh, event. Huge conference. Thousands of people from around the world. Russia was here talking about technology, and our platform was talking about technology in Africa. That I was with the CEO of Orange. And uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful time because we were able to see what's possible and can be done in the continent using leapfrogging on technology to help fast forward or make the transformation of Africa a little faster. All right, tell us about this mm -hmm. platform. If we move back to agriculture and farming mm -hmm. on the continent, what got you started with this? Well, Jeff's on Farms was a personal story because it's been years now. Every year I go back to Africa, every month and a half I go to Senegal two months and uh, one time, two years ago, I started to just to pay attention to uh, everything I'm eating, uh, the chebujend, our national dish in Senegal, 90% of everything in, the, in there, from the oil to the rice uh, to uh, all of the vegetables most of the time are coming from overseas. And I started questioning myself, how come a country like mine or the continent of Africa, the youngest population in the world, we have sun 365, 365 days in the year, uh, we have the 65% of edible land in the continent, and we still importing 30 billion US dollars of food in the continent. And everything I'm eating in my house is coming from overseas. And how come countries like France, countries like Morocco and extra, which many of those countries only farm six, seven months out of the year, are feeding us? And I say, I want to do something about that. Well, Africa This is why I started the Jefferson Farms, to make sure that from my house first, that everything I eat comes from the country and the farmers from the country. Then it went into engaging young people to take control of our own economy, not only our own economy, but the core of our economy, which is agriculture. You cannot talk about independence, I mean, you cannot feed yourself. Let's stay with that, Tion, because Africa's mm -hmm. annual food import bill is about $35 billion. That's expected to uh, go up and up from here. That's mm -hmm. really weakening Africa's economy. But it's, it's more than weakening it, because by 2050, you're looking at Right now, at $35 billion. By 2050, experts talk about we're going over $100 billion, which is billions of dollars of business that some people will make a lot of money, but Africans. Okay? And then who's controlling you, who's giving you food, is controlling you. There's no real economy when you cannot feed yourself. Uh, and there's a lot of factors into that, because I believe that um, most of the food that we're importing to bring in our countries, oil, we get it from Ukraine and Malaysia, for example, in Senegal, rice and etc. All of those things that's coming in the country, the vegetables, the food that are frozen most of the time also that are coming in, have some health issues also. And, and, and this is critical. But when we make sure that we send young people back into farms, make sure that they believe in farming again, that we make it attractive, that people like us who went overseas, who travel, who understand the world, coming back and investing into agriculture will help draw young people to leave back the cities, go back in the farms and help feed the countries, but also help create jobs for these min millions of young Africans who uh, finish universities looking for opportunities to work and sometimes can find them. This is the reason why they are taking sometimes the cities to go, to live in c cities like Dakar, Nairobi, etc. How can we But make even Rochelle, to add to this, they go all over taking the oceans to come here in, in, in Europe and the United States and extra looking for dreams that doesn't exist at all, you know? OK, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, Tion Yang, uh, you are the founder of Jeff Zone Farms. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for Today. having me. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's just finish up by telling you that uh, Mali has lost one of its uh, finest singers. Kassim Madi Diabati has died in Bamako, aged 69. He was a descendant of a long line of Mangriots who were reputed for their musical excellence. His career took, took off uh, in 1970s when he began f performing with Super Monday. He released his first album called Four Day in 1989. His last album, Kirike, was released in 2014 and highlighted his love of the acoustic sound of tradition. We leave you with uh, his music. <laughs> Kaluwa 
to jam fasirila ama de morila kela sera wonuma wonula jam fatia jam fasirila